everyone and welcome to the True Potential Do More With Your Money podcast number 41 on the 30th of October. Um, it's going to be an investment special today. My name is Mark Henderson and I'm joined by George Bell, one of our uh, True Potential analysts, Jeff Casson, Chief Investment Officer and Steve Hutton, who's Head of True Potential Wealth Management. So good morning, gentlemen. Morning, Mark. Now, what we'll do this morning is begin with the weekly roundup of the markets. And um, I think I'll, I'll go to Jeff to begin with. Um, we had, we had a, a reasonable start to the week, Jeff, we and did. then a little bit of action. Yes, the, the week has been, I suppose, one where, where volatility has, has moved up uh, ever so slightly. We know that, that volatility has been sort of trending up into the period of the, the US election, and that's been very evident this week with the volatility index, the VIX that we've touched on before, moving back up to, to 40, a level that we haven't seen since, I think, June of, of this year. Um, so that has really played its way through in, in asset markets, but primarily in equity markets. And I think that's the, the important thing to, to really get out here, that the role of diversification in portfolios and in multi-asset portfolios is, is crucial to provide um, protection, mitigation against some of that, that volatility that we've seen in, in equity markets. And just taking a little bit of a, a step back on that, the, the volatility in equity markets is focused on some particular sectors at times this week as well. So we had the German technology company, SAP, um, announcing results on Sunday night. Never a good, uh, good indication of good news when somebody puts out results on a Sunday night. Um, and lo and behold, it was a bit disappointing for the market, and we saw that, that, that stock fall some 20% on the day. And that has provided a bit of a precursor to what we've seen through the week with some of those areas of the equity market that have performed well, uh, being more, more volatile as we, we've, we've seen. And then overnight, we had um, a large number of the US technology companies reporting as well. So that'll be something that I'm sure we can come on to and, and discuss. But just looking at other asset markets over the course of the week, equities, yes, where the volatility has been. We didn't really see that in, in bond markets. Bond markets are relatively unchanged over the course of the week with uh, sovereign yields pretty stable. Uh, US sort of around 80 basis points and UK gilts sort of in around 23, 24 basis points over the course of the week. Currencies been a little bit about dollar strength, and we've 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 seen that play out again. Bit of risk in the market. People focused in on on the dollar for a, a degree of, of of protection. I suppose just that normal flight to, to safety that, that we see. And then the other area where there is sort of negative or downside is is in the oil market. Oil has been very volatile this year, and just as we've seen uh, lockdowns been increased um, in. Germany, France, even where Steve is, he's now, now locked down more. Uh, the demand for, for oil has been coming under a little bit of pressure and that has started to, to play into the, the oil market. We've seen a bit of weakness uh, this week. It's interesting because we've had meetings with a couple of the managers this week, some in-depth um, meetings. One of them who, who focuses on the UK market, Jeff, and a, another that is a fully diversified um, manager. And their view on the, the, the COVID situation was, was a little bit different. But at the, I suppose a, a, a view that we're not picking up through the press was the, 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 the idea that you know, the UK, we could well have picked now when we look back at this in a, in a couple of weeks' time, and the US could be heading towards a peak. And there's a lot of different, different yeah. things. I know you said yeah. at the moment we're right in the middle of yeah. lots of lots of different factors which are yeah. affecting and the markets. I think that's that's right. And uh, you know, if we look back to, to March as well, how things have really evolved from there. And you think about test and trace here in the UK, many other places, the data is very different. And I think that's the the, the, the key thing that we need to take a a step back and just look at what the, the data is telling us. And th yes infection rates are rising and we see that but what we we haven't really seen yet is a significant spike in in hospitalizations and, and things like that so that's one thing that was giving that manager a degree of comfort about the the trajectory of where things are 
um, at, at this point in time. And you know, there's many other factors that are, are influencing markets at this point in time. We just have to look at to the US where, what is it, five days, four days ahead of, of a presidential election. And that has really uh, been at the front and center of people's minds. We've got Trump tweeting again last night, re-elect me and we'll get a big stimulus bill coming through. So all of these things are, are, are playing out in the market and being things that are challenging investors, but again, speaking to why you want to be diversified, why you want to use multi-asset to allow you to achieve your savings goals. It provides that ballast within the portfolio at, at, times, of, at times of stress. Sure. And George, you, know, you, you speak to, to managers regularly and you help form the true potential house view. Um, on volatility, for, for our investors, George, what, what does volatility mean from them and how can we play to the positives of this? Yeah, absolutely, Mark. So Jeff mentioned the VIX index there. We mentioned that on, on morning markets as well. So the VIX Monday, that, that, that moved from a level of 30 to 31 and a half, peaked at around 40 on this day as Jeff mentioned. So what, what does that VIX index mean? Well, this is an analogy I, I got from one of our managers when speaking to them a few months back, and it's around temperature and thinking about the, the sort of temperature which human beings are, are comfortable in. It's typically a range of around 17 to 23 degrees. Anything above that on the in day-to-day -day life, people start to feel a little bit uncomfortable. So that's a similar sort of range to the VIX index. If we look back at the long-term average of the VIX, if we go back, say, 30 years, the average has been between a range of, say, 17 to, to 23. We've been sitting in a, a range above that for the, the last eight months now, give or take August, where volatility came down a little bit. But we have been in a, a period of, of what we call elevated volatility. So the key driver of that has been COVID-19 and the impact of, of lockdown restrictions. And then on the way out, the impact on supply chains, the pace of recovery and any information which could slow down that pace. If volatility is already elevated, though, why is it picked up this week? And I think it's primarily, as Jeff mentioned, the, the reimposition of, of lockdown restrictions in many parts of Europe and, and rising cases across the US. But what does that mean for, say, true potential investors? I think, you know, the, the, the same level of volatility is not felt across all asset classes, as, as Jeff mentioned. Jeff mentioned the bond markets. I mean, yields are generally down on on where we were at the beginning of the week, UK bond um, on the, the 10 year is down around four or five basis points, but movements there have not been as aggressive as what you felt in the equity market. So that's why a diversified portfolio solution does help control the volatility which you feel within, within investments relative to the headline numbers which we refer to there, which are primarily based on, on equity markets. But it can also present an opportunity, Mark, and this is where the conversations which we have with our managers really comes in handy because we are providing our managers with regular flows. And that's a real strength in this environment, frankly. It's being able to take that money and put that money to work where you are seeing divergence in the market, where you are seeing disconnect and where you are seeing valuations pull back or, or pricing of, of units pull back at a level which and this field is, is potentially exaggerated. So it can, you know, the multi-asset solution could provide that ability to control volatility for our, our clients in, in a portfolio solution, but volatility can also present opportunity as well. Okay, before I t turn to Steve at the, uh, in a moment, what you said there, George, is key because you, you're mentioning the flows, that's positive, that's money coming into the funds and we're seeing actually record levels of investment coming into True Potential uh, this quarter and indeed as we close off October this month. And what it means for our managers and for ourselves is that there's new money coming in, there's cash to invest, and we can time that investment by picking up bargains as we see them coming along. It means that managers don't have to sell one particular asset class to buy another because cash will drive those trades. So that's, that's from the investment side and hopefully not too much jargon in that. But Steve, from, from the client side, what does volatility mean and, and how should, should they regard seeing the markets going up and down on a regular basis? Thanks for that. Morning, everybody. Hi. Um, 
I'm speaking as the, the guy who you know, deals with all our advisors and our clients, but I'm also speaking as an investor myself and not one who benefits um, from the knowledge and experience of my colleagues here. But the, the thing about volatility is that um, it really is corrosive when it's a surprise and it's a shock. And what I'm saying there is, it, let's use an analogy of an aircraft. If, you're, if, if the pilot comes on and says, we're, you know, we've had information that we're about to fly into some turbulent air, but don't worry, everybody, we're, we're aware it's coming, um, buckle up. It might be a little bit uncomfortable for a while, but I'm in control. You buckle up and you sit there a little apprehensive, but you sail through it and you're fine. If you're sitting there having your, your lunch and suddenly you drop, you know, a thousand feet or whatever, it's a major shock and it starts to frighten you. And your behavior then starts to make you, you know, behave a little erratically. What we are doing at True Potential is making sure that our clients are fully informed. So you look at all our output now, our, our podcasts and our daily morning markets, et cetera, et cetera. We're giving you the heads up that this volatility isn't a surprise to us. It's not a shock. You know, we're positioned accordingly. We're positioned both from a, an asset class perspective, but also from a geographic perspective. Because if you look at, um, historically, we've always, you know, when, when the markets have had turbulence and had a drop, we've had to wait quite a few years for the next one to come along. Everything seems to work a lot quicker in this modern world. So we've actually got March as a template and a benchmark to look back at and say, OK, we saw what happened in March. Something similar might happen. It might happen again now. It might not. But we've got a benchmark to, to refer back to. So from a client perspective, um, clients seem a little bit more resilient this time. We're not getting the, the volume of emails and, and, and telephone traffic that we got in March. And I think it is because we're communicating regularly. It's no surprise to everybody that this volatility was coming. You know, we've got a, a global pandemic going on, which has not been sorted yet. No matter, we weren't all sitting there in, in the summer when we had some release from lockdown thinking we were out of the woods. We knew something was yet to happen, so that's not a surprise. We've got a US election, which one that is as close and as you know diverse as this one was always going to make make volatility come back again. And in the UK, we've got also Brexit over you know coming over the horizon as well. So it's no surprise to us, and it should be no surprise to our clients. I'm sure it isn't that markets are going to get a little bit more turbulent. And I'll finish off here, Mark, on this point by just saying we expected it. We're positioned accordingly. So in my previous core analogy. We're buckled up, we're ready, and we're going to sail through it. The, the other end to that poor analogy is you would look really strange if when the plane started to have turbulent moments, you pushed your way to the front and started to want to fly the plane yourself. So I'm saying to everybody, stay in your seats, trust the experts, which you've done. You've set out on your goal path, stay with it. We'll get you through this, and hopefully you will achieve your goals and financial uh, satisfaction. I think that's right, Steve. You know, the, 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 sticking to goals is very very important the goal doesn't change the journey slightly might but we'll get on track and and return now there's three things that you've mentioned there i'm going to take the first one which is covid and what's happening at the moment seems to be almost a polarized view it's either the health of the nation or the economy and i i don't think that's right i think it's not quite as clear as that and again just reading a report before we came on to record this, you know, the, it said Boris Johnson's under pressure for new lockdown. I'm not putting him in, under any pressure. I'm sure Jeff's not. Steve, you're under tier three at the moment, so you're not after any further lockdown. But I'd lo I want to try and examine this and challenge that uh, uh, view that it's either health or economy. And Jeff, you know, I'll hand that one over to you. I suppose the, the, the two things do in some way go in hand to hand, but do they have to go in hand to hand is, is probably the, the question. And it maybe goes back to something that we said at the start and, and something that, that Steve was bringing out there, thinking about the journey that, that we're on and using data to help us inform that journey. And if we go back to the, the political dimension, I suppose the start of the rhetoric was that, well, it will be driven by the data. And then the data started to tell us something different and then we got an interpretation of that. If we think about our approach, it's about taking a diversification and a diversified view of what's happening, bringing in various different sources of information to think about how we construct portfolios and how we build that. And I think that's what we, we want to get, a di diversification of views into to the mix as to, to what is the, the right approach. Now, that right approach could be anything that's on the table today but we can look to 
other countries and we can look to, to Asia, I think, to get some sense of how they have managed to, to navigate their way through this. And if we think about how, you know, South Korea, for example, even Japan, uh, China, etc., have dealt with this, they have, have dealt differently. And they have seen uh, economic recovery come back faster, one would argue, than, than the UK and, and Europe. And they've also been re able to reopen um, their economies faster as well. So there was a lag to, yeah. to services coming back, um, but it, it has started to come back in Asia. So there is a, there is a challenge between the politics and, and, and the economics, and we're very much aware of that. And I think, you know, to, to build on what, what Steve was discussing there, through this whole period, we've been sort of discussing how we view it through four different lenses, for want of a better way to describe it, and looking at COVID as being one of those, but thinking about you know, infection rates, mortality rates, and then where are we with health advances? We go back to March, it was kind of unknown. How does one treat this? What do we do? We've got a, a set of protocols that allow people to use different drugs, et cetera, to, to help and, and mitigate that. We're much further along um, the, the vaccine work as well. We've thought about what does it mean from a, a fiscal and a monetary perspective? How does that interact? So that's another view that we've taken on it. We've looked at how economies have recovered, and that's a, another lens that we look at. And then political risk, you know, that's, that's evident for us all to see. But those are the four lenses, if you will, that we've looked at it. We've thought about it when we're looking after our, our clients' assets and discussed with their managers. And that provides that that perspective and that differentiation of, of view to think about how do you position a portfolio to, to navigate through the, the analogy that Steve's given of turbulence. Yeah, and and sure. that's, that's what, what we're attempting to do, looking at it on that basis. And in the UK, you know, we, we're talking about further guilt purchases um, through QE. Um, yeah. And the, this, the specter, I suppose, of negative interest rates. Yeah. Um, we had negative oil prices earlier on in the COVID, uh, yeah. the COVID months. Yes. That didn't mean that no. petrol was being given away, Jeff. Uh, no. What would negative interest rates mean to save us in the UK? I think, well, uh, where are we with negative interest rates in, in, in the UK? And it's, it's quite a fascinating discussion. Um, it was obviously touched upon when, when rates got down to, to 10 bips. Um, it then sort of went out of the press and though that's not something that we would, would consider. And then with the last MPC um, minutes, we got it tucked away in the final paragraph that it had been a, a topic of discussion uh, within the, the, the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee. And what have we seen since that? Well, we've seen some policymakers roll back in the idea. So very much Andrew Bailey, sort of Dave Ramsden as well. Pushing back, no, that's not not something that that we're we're, we're likely to get. But I, I do wonder: is there something in it? Because we've got the the Bank of England asking the Prudential Regulatory Authority to discuss it with banks. How would you deal with um, this? There was a consultative process put out there. Lo and behold, it was only for a month. Yeah. So they have to get their their responses back by. I think the 12th or the 14th of, of November, which does coincide with um, uh, the, the next MPC meeting or maybe just after it. But do I think we're going to go there just yet? Probably not. I think, as you rightly, rightly say, there is more that being, can be done with the, the asset purchasing programme. And that probably is their, their favoured port of call initially. Thinking about what does, does negative interest rates really mean for, for us as people in the UK, um, what does it mean for our savings? Well, clearly over the past number of years, we've been seeing a steady decline in, in rates. So we haven't really been getting very much um, for, for what we've been saving. But the, the ironic thing with, with negative interest rates probably means we get zero. Yeah. And one of the other things for, for us in the UK, which is maybe something we're not used to, is paying for banking services. Negative rates is a, is a big issue for a bank in terms of their, their balance sheet. They take in our deposits. They would deposit those with, with another provider, i.e. the Bank of England, and they would make some money on that. At negative rates, the Bank of England are forcing them to lend. And that's the, that's the key difference. They, they, they don't want your money. They could charge you for the, the privilege of, of protecting your money. 
Uh, they might even charge us for current accounts, something that is not usual in the UK, but is more of a standard operating model in, in Europe and, and in the US. So there are, there are many implications of it. Um, but the other side of it, has it worked anywhere else? So we've had negative rates in, in Europe. Um, one would argue that that hasn't been a, a great model for success as yet. So uh, I think the, the jury is out, but clearly it's something that is being, is being discussed and being considered. And Steve, bringing you in on this one, you know, negative interest rates and, and is, a, is a step down from where we are at the moment, which is not a good place to be. Um, you have many, many clients and they, they become our clients who are, have looked at alternatives to cash-based investment over the years. How would you uh, look at the market and the prospect of even less interest being paid on, on, on bank accounts and savings? Yeah, um, it, it's a really interesting point around negative interest rates, but from a client perspective now, interest rates at these levels, whether they go negative or not, it, you know, if they stay around the same level, you're effectively getting nothing. What you are getting, though, is the effect of inflation on your on your savings. Uh, and I can't see in the foreseeable future, uh, you know, deposit rates overtaking the rate of inflation. So you're going to be losing money. And I think it's crucial that we say, and we've said this before, and I apologise for saying it again, but it's a really, it's a crucial point because it's linked back to the, the, the discussion we just had on volatility. Do not let the market spook you into running to cash. Because as we've said before, cash and investing in it is an investment decision. Cash is an asset class. So if you're an, a client like myself and I suddenly decide to run to cash, I'm making an investment decision that I'm not skilled or equipped to make. And in doing so, I will be investing in an asset class that's got, you know, guaranteed almost to make sure I lose money going forward. So I would counsel everybody, please, you know, leave your money with the experts. Don't be tempted to run to cash. I think, you know, a lot of our clients have investments, but they also have savings, and, and they're consciously looking for other ways of, of investing to get return. Now, if you look at all our investment propositions at, at, at True Potential and True Potential Investments, you've got all varying different degrees of risk. So you can go in at the cautious end where you take a little bit of risk, but you hopefully then outperform, you know, a cash investment. So come and talk to us, talk to your advisor, because there are alternatives out there. And it's not all in, you know, you don't have to go all in in a high aggressive equity only based fund where, you know, you're sitting every day watching the TV, um, you know, and you're frightened. Go and, you know, have a discussion with your investment advisor and talk about the right route for you, because I'm pretty sure it's not cash. Um, and, the, and the future for cash is, is not king. You know, it's going to be, it's going to be a difficult asset class to make any money in strangely enough, you know, over the next few years. And Steve, right. you, you mentioned goals as well earlier on. It's all to do with client goals and, and, and achieving those which cash won't do. It is not. And, you know, the best way to achieve your goals is obviously to set them and stick to them. But when you're, when you're trying to achieve your goals, you've got to look for every opportunity you get in the market. Now, we know what's happening in the investment world. We're outsourcing that to our professionals. Uh, you know, Jeff and, and, and George and the team and yourselves, and then our underlying managers. But you can help yourself as well. The government gives you very attractive still, um, you know, allowances on, against tax for certain types of savings. Now, if I could say to you all, I can give you an investment that will guarantee you will get a 25% return or even a 40, 45% return, you probably take it. Well, I can do that. You should invest into your pension. So go again and see your advisor Put money in your pension and you will get a really generous tax refund, tax rebate at this stage. That won't be available forever. So again, in the strongest possible terms, these are always discussed when the government's balance sheet is looking very stretched. They're looking at how they can take these allowances away. And I'm, you know, we say this every year, but it's getting ever more, you know, important and ever more likely that they will take away some of the very attractive pension benefits we've got. So get in, invest in your pension while you can, and you'll get this tax rebate from the government, which gives you an immediate lift on your on your investments. You know, 25%, crikey, that's a significant input. So I would, you know, in the strongest possible terms, as I've said, get your tax allowances used up every year while you can. Absolutely, Steve. I couldn't uh, 
agree more with you there. And I've just seen George take a drink, so I think I'll um, bring him in now and, and ask him. You know, you, you mentioned before uh, the positive cash flows going into our funds, George, but the managers that we have and ourselves, we can hold a little bit of cash in the funds ready to invest. So have you, have you picked up anything from the managers you've been speaking to over the last week, say, or the last month, where they're, they're holding a little bit more cash ready for investment? Yeah, you, we, we, we did see that earlier in the month. One of our managers in particular has um, been taking a, a view, which is to lean into some of the areas which they see recovery in. So some of those areas such as the emerging markets, areas such as Japan, and they've been doing this incrementally. So it's a really focused approach. They understand the level of risk they want to be taken, the level of market beta, as we, we would refer to it as, and the point in which to access that. So we've seen waves in which they've been holding back on some of the cash flows. And then over the week, we've seen that being deployed. So in our morning meetings, each day we, we look at the trades which are being enacted by our fund managers. So we've got that absolute transparency and we can see that money being put to work. That's not just with that one particular manager. We've seen examples elsewhere. But what that's demonstrating is the, the active nature of, of the managers we work with their ability to set strategy, not intraday, this is a longer term strategy, but using that that cash flow in, in a positive way to, to get them there and using that volatility as a stepping stone. Yeah, I, think, I think that's Sorry, just, yeah. just to, to build on that. I think that's the crucial point that going back to where the, the conversation has been that these managers are working actively, they're deploying cash when they see, see opportunity to do that. One of the big challenges for each of us as an individual is that if you do go to cash what's your catalyst for getting back in and we know that the market has been volatile and we know that when you're you're out of the market and you miss some of the the, the better days it has a very significant impact on your ability to achieve your goal so these our managers through our solutions are actively managing it and looking for opportunities to to deploy cash when it when it is the right thing to do and i think that's crucial when one thinks about how we, we save, how we achieve our savings goals, but also why it's important to, to stay invested, but stay invested in the, the products that are right for you, as Steve says, across the, the risk spectrum, but, but keep invested and let the managers take the, the action that's required. Yeah. <clears throat> and Jeff, you know, before we leave the UK and move across to the US, have there been any real Brexit developments which have affected the funds or the portfolios this week? Not, not massively this week, thankfully. Um, it seems like one of these things in the, when I'm doing the morning markets video, it's, well, will I talk about Brexit today or will I not? Because there seems to be a headline that you can grab or you can hear somebody has said something over the, the course of the, the week. But what do we know? We've got discussions, it would appear, ongoing again with Europe or until somebody decides to stop them again. Um, we got the trade deal. Um, penned and signed with, with Japan that was put on the table um, earlier in September. So that's done. Um, now we just need to, I suppose, get the rest finished and, and kind of move on. I think we would all be quite sort of pleased if this was a topic that, that wasn't on the agenda. Um, and we had, why do I say that? Because we would like some clarity. Yeah. <clears throat> Business would like clarity as to how they're going to operate, be it with a deal or without a deal. It's just clarity, yes. and, and that's probably the, the important thing that we would like to achieve at, at some point in the coming months. Now then, clarity, turning to next week in the US election. Um, <laughs> so certain data points are pointing to um, improved US economy, which many people f think favor Donald yep. Trump and the Republicans. Um, others are saying that, that the perceived market risk with the Democrats moved with Joe Biden's uh, nomination. Where are we at the moment? Well, we're we're coming into a crucial weekend of of campaigning by both in, in a number of the the swing states in the U.S. We've seen both candidates um, be in Florida um, over the past couple of days to try and um, swing the vote one way or the other. There, Florida is a, a pretty crucial. Um, state, given it's the electoral college system in the US, I think there's 29 electoral colleges in, in, in Florida, which can be very important um, when it comes to the, the conclusion of this uh, next week. Um, so 
over the course of the weekend, we'll just see more and more campaigning. We'll see more and more people coming out with polls that suggest that at a national level, things are maybe getting a little bit tighter um, between Democrats and, and Republicans. That just, I think, speaks to what we, where we started the conversation, yeah. a bit of volatility, uncertainty in, in, in the market. The other side of it, I suppose, is what does it mean for the market? Um, you rightly have pointed out where Biden, Democrats, people were pretty nervous um, if I roll back nine months ago on what a Democratic um, president and or control of the, the House and Senate could mean. That seems to have, have, have dissipated a, a little bit over the, the past number of weeks. And that, I think, is primarily as people have started to assess policies and think about how those policies might be implemented, it takes time. Nothing happens in day one and it will take time. Things will be traded off, a bit like we see here with, with Brexit. Things will be traded back and forth to get an agreement through. That's what will what'll happen in the US. I think the other side of it is, is probably just around um, economic stimulus, economic support. Um, both candidates know more is required and the market in and of itself thinks that that will come regardless of which is is in the White House. So I think that's probably one of the things that's allowed the market to continue to move uh, the way it has over the, the past number of weeks that something will be done. But that again sounds a bit like a broken record because we've been waiting for something there since the end of July. And I think, the, you know, I said before about the UK being polarised on COVID between health and economy. I think that the US market is as well. And the, the, if I just take a couple of issues, you've got taxation, which a Democrat win would increase taxation. Republican win, there could be further tax cuts. Um, we've got in finance, again, for Joe Biden, it could result in stricter rules of enforcement and yeah. regulation, you yeah. know, um, limits on dividends and buybacks, whereas with, with Donald Trump, we could see some more executive orders, which just result in further deregulization. And I, I read another um, bit of research this week where I said that if banks, instead of them being a problem, could now be part of the solution to bring everybody together in, in the US, which is quite interesting. But I, I want to bring George in at this, this moment because I think one area that isn't polarized is the US reaction to China, because there's tensions across both parties. And the, 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 the need, I think, from the US point of view to protect their uh, intellectual property rights. And if, if Trump got elected, we could see more of the same tariffs, um, which would be there to, to, as an aim to reduce the US trade deficit, George. So how, how do we see, um, the, the US-China relationship affecting markets and portfolios? Well, it's, a, it's in, interesting timing the, the question, Mark, because this week it's um, the, the, the 14th China five-year economic plan. So they effectively set policy investment, uh, you know, economic goals. And George, George, could I just interrupt and not to throw you off your, 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 um, your story there, but last night George was staying late because we'd asked him to look at the five-year plan and it was after what, about 6.30 where George's head went into his hands when he realised that the, the release was all in Mandarin, <laughs> so he stayed late. <laughs> I'd, I'd love to say I learned very quick how to read Mandarin, <laughs> but uh, I, I also found a translator as well, so that came in pretty handy. But um, yeah, so, so we started to get information coming out last night and, and the information it has been fairly moderated and that's because of a lot of what, what China are planning to do over the next five years is what they call dual circularization, which is really all about increasing domestic consumption in China, it's investing in China, it's investing in China's infrastructure, defense systems, um, medical innovation technology. So there's there's a lot of work which will be going in, which is China focused. That has the potential to to really upset the US. And and you know we saw this back in 2016 when Made in China started to come about. Donald Trump was very much on the front foot in attacking that. I think you know as we as we look to the impact which uh, trade with uh, on trade in China with the Democrats or, or, or the Republicans. I think the general consensus is the Democrats will take a less abrasive approach 
Um, they'll be, they've both got the same objective. I think, you know, markets were a little bit surprised to see, you know, Joe Biden, he's, he's, he's no free market trader. He, he is looking to, to develop America and develop America's infrastructure um, and scale globally. So he will be pushing back, but arguably in, in a less aggressive approach than what we've seen under the Trump administration so far. That area of the, the trade deficit with China, you know, Donald Trump has been effective in pulling that in somewhat, but it's been a bumpy ride along the way and, and tariffs um, have been the main tool. So what could you see under the Biden administration? Well, we could see some of those tariffs being pulled back on. You could see a bit more flexibility and that, that may be, and this is just based on some of the discussions we've been having, is you know, they could use that as leverage to help them meet, meet other objectives, such as the carbon emission objectives in there as well. So two very different approaches to, to the same goal, which is really to strengthen the American economy, um, but with a different tact in terms of how they go about that ongoing trade relationship with China. It's also worth thinking about that and sort of what does it mean for medium to longer term, because China will continue to grow and that is sort of that's a given and it will continue to grow, at, yes, at a slower rate, but even a slower rate on a very large number equates to quite significant growth that China will, will deliver in terms of a numerical GDP value. So at one level, yes, we can hear what the, the politicians have to say, and it does go down well with their, their various electorates, but then there is a need to find out or to find a way to actually interact with China in a way that is is important for the US because the US and China's trading relationship is so important and it's so important to the global economy. So it's how the, the global economy finds a way to work with China as well, which will be crucially important. And that that is something that we all and their you know we discuss with their managers on a regular basis. How is that likely to evolve? Because that's going to be the crucial factor for, for the global economy. So it's not just that re interaction with the US, but how does Europe deal with China? How does the rest of Asia deal with China? That's all crucially important as well in that. And we can't forget that at one level, the relationship with the US dominates, but we need to think about the relationship with other areas of the, the global economy as well. Absolutely. And, and Steve, are you finding many clients are asking questions about the US election? I think, I think it's something that everyone's interested in, Mark. Um, yeah, for different reasons, really. The guys have just talked about the economic reasons and the investment opportunities, which are really interesting. It is, there's an area of excitement around, I think, to, to see what's going to happen in the US. If you recall with, with Hillary Clinton, it was about this time, I think it was four days before the election, that James Comer came out and said he was going to investigate her emails again. So we're all sort of sitting and wondering, is there another James Comer moment coming this weekend? I suspect we're a little late now. Um, and I also suspect that uh, Trump's tweet last night to say, you know, elect me and I'll give a stimulus is, is a little desperate. Mm -hmm. If you look at the background state, the battleground states now, he seems to have given up on Pennsylvania and realised that's going back Democrat. Yeah. That was one that, you know, caused Hillary a lot of distress. Um, he's interesting, he's having to fight in Texas, which is usually staunchly Republic. uh, so, Republican. So he's, I think he realises the signs are not good for him. And it's interesting from our perspective that the market hasn't freaked out about a Biden presidency. No, no. Uh, this volatility isn't about Biden coming to the throne. It, it's you know it's about COVID and, and what's happening in lockdown, etc. And I also think, just to reiterate, some of the clients have been thinking about their views, and, and some of them around the fact that Biden will be a more conciliatory president is probably good now. Yeah, Trump served his purpose in the sense he's shaking up the market, he's shaking up the world, kind of you know comfort zones about the, the relationships with each other. It almost needs uh, a period of someone to come along now and say, OK, we don't want we don't want this turbulence anymore. Let's work together and move forward. And I think George's point that, um, you know, Biden isn't some kind of weird free market here. They all realize that they have to repatriate jobs to the US. Um, and so I think it will be really interesting, really interesting four days, five days coming up. Can't wait. Um, we've got a meeting on Wednesday and I'll be very tired, I think, because I'll say it very late on <laughs> tonight watching the results. But uh, I'm not wearing blue for any particular reason. <laughs> it's not a blue wave, Steve. <laughs> there must be some red somewhere just to be uh, politically correct, which I'm well known for. Being. Yes, you are. We are. Um, just uh, finally on the US election, that's one of the topics we covered in this 
caught us true insight, which are, we were um, desperate to get dropped through the letterboxes of our true potential portfolio clients this week uh, rather than next week. So there's some further reading in there for everyone. Um, I, I want to close on the US um, by, by looking at the, the technology sector because we had some results overnight. And Jeff, we have some very interesting results as well and the reaction to those results. Yeah, no, I think that's right. So we heard from Apple, Amazon, Alphabet and uh, Facebook overnight, some of those stocks that have been crucial to the, the performance of the, the S&P over the, the course of the year. And you know, they delivered tremendous results when you think about the 18% revenue growth as a, as a collective, 30% profit growth. Um, for, for the quarter on a year-in-year -year basis. Tremendous, um, I suppose, delivery speaks to, you know, we all are using those um, models of uh, either buying things or technology that they provide at this point in time. So that's been there and, and, and delivered. I think the other point around it has been that these uh, stocks, how did they perform up after ours, which gives us a bit of an indication as to how they might perform today in the market. They did come off a little bit. Um, and we saw that play through into to futures this morning. But interestingly, if we look at just where Europe is at the moment, it did look as if it was going to be down one and a half, two percent. Um, it's not. It's actually up um, as we as we stand at this point in time. And I think that speaks to people sort of digesting what came out of the ECB yesterday and the, the potential for, for further support. We'll see. We'll get to see more this afternoon when when the US opens and how some of these stocks. Uh, react to that. But again, they are a part of, of a diversified portfolio. It's They aren't going to de deliver the outcome for, for a multi-asset portfolio and, and that's the, the important thing. You have exposure to them but we don't have an outsized exposure to them within the portfolios. And Jeff, the terms after hours, I mean it, it sounds a bit like a, a lock-in as, as, <laughs> as most of us would, would actually welcome being able to go to the pub, never mind having a lock-in. But after hours, Explain yeah, it's so once the, the equity market closes in, in the US, there is effectively another market that starts to open up after that. And within that, you can get trading of, of some of the securities on the market. Not all of the securities, but typically you do get a good, re, a good indication from that market when a company has reported results. It allows you to see just the initial assessment, the initial takeaway from investors, whether you get a positive or a negative move. So last night, you know, Alphabet, Google had a, had a very strong yep. aftermarket reaction up over 8% on, on the day. The others slightly, slightly less so. And that, I think that was what was in my mind when I opened this up and said we saw some action later on in the week. That was, that was what we'd been looking for this, this week really, how the tech stocks were going yep. to perform, how the, how the results were looking in the, in the US. Um, well, I think that that pretty much brings us to a close today. Um, we couldn't say that there's a, the, the diversification is not important. I think what we've highlighted today is it is vitally important as we spread client money across various asset classes all the way around the world in different industries and not just in the equity markets as well, in the bond markets. So um, thank you everybody for, for watching us. Before we go, I'd just like to ask everybody what's, what's they got planned for this weekend. I'll uh, start with you, Steve, uh, because you're, you're in tier three. So this might be very, very short. Yeah, um, a bit curtailed my weekend, Mark. So I'm going back to what has proved my biggest fault during lockdown. I've started to buy things online. <laughs> yeah, and uh, a couple of funny stories. I bought a drum kit, so I'm going to learn the drums. But yesterday was the funniest one because I uh, I must have got very depressed earlier in the week, and I bought a lot of cushions, but I forgot to actually put them to deliver to our home address, so they actually delivered to my wife's work address. <laughs> so it went down really well. So I'll probably be buying some more home furnishings this weekend, and and you know, it's getting in touch with you know. So you might have those cushions by this time next year, Steve. Well, she, she was actually using public transport yesterday, so she did say, how do you expect me to carry four cushions home on public transport? I said, that, my dear, is your chance. And Steve, please, were they the exact words she used? No, no, she's, uh, she's got away with words, Mark. <laughs> George, what have you got planned up under Tyne Valley?
I'm decorating this week this weekend, Mark. And I had an hour where I had the chance to forget about it there with the podcast, but uh, you've just brought it back to my attention, so decorating for me. Oh, well. I think I'd rather be in tier three, George. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff? Um, I suppose this weekend we'll be out and about with the, the boys, get out and about, play some rugby, some football. Hopefully the weather's kind to us. Six Nations might not be there, might they, eh, Jeff? It might not be, no. How are Bradford getting on, Steve? Uh, we're poised and ready, Mark. Poised and ready to catapult off the bottom of Division 2. <laughs> well, I think, you know, in an uncertain world, I think what we've got is the certainty that Donald Trump hasn't booked the removal men in for next week. So um, that will be something interesting to watch as well. Just yeah. how long, if, it, if the vote does go against him, how long it takes him to vacate the White House. A period of time. A period of time. Do you think the, um, the, the federal, the Supreme Court now is stacked in his favour, yep. and Brett yeah. Kavanaugh has already sort of cast aspersions as to the validity of the results. So that could be really interesting. Yeah, interesting. What right. happens? There? We'll see if Steve gets his cushions before Joe Biden gets his feet under the, the <laughs> desk in the Oval Office. They're actually blue cushions. <laughs> oh well, there you go. Blue jumper, blue shirt, blue cushions. Thank you, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed it and uh, we'll see you next week. Subscribing to True Potential YouTube channel is quick and easy. Simply go to your YouTube app on your phone, type in True Potential and press the red subscribe option. You'll then be notified as and when new videos are released.